Good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Scott Morrison today. In fact, I think we're really lucky to have him here because um, we're getting, I'm assuming, an extended version of the talk he's going to give in two weeks' time at the Shine Dome because Scott's recently been awarded the Christopher Heidi Medal from the uh, Australian Academy of Science. And this always comes with a little presentation in front of all of the fellows. So, uh, I think treat us as, uh, <laughs> as so it's, it's my pleasure to have him here. Uh, Scott did his uh, PhD in Berkeley under uh, the uh, guidance, I guess, of Vaughan Jones, probably known to everyone. And uh, I think uh, some of today's title uh, shows this. In fact, after that, he went to, uh, at first, when I, of course, realized that, I thought, oh, that's no good, Microsoft. But uh, he did something pretty interesting there, because this is uh, topological quantum computing. I, I'm not really sure what that is, well, I'll say but about again, we'll hear <laughs> about that today. After that, he went uh, back to Berkeley, and I think it's about three years? Three years now, yeah. He's been at the uh, ANU, and currently is, uh, holds an ARC, uh, is it a DECRA? Yeah. Or DECRA fellowship, so Scott's been doing really, really well, and uh, well, look forward to learning about uh, Topological quantum computing. <laughs> Thanks very much for the introduction. Yeah, um, so I have about five times longer today uh, to talk about the stuff than I do two weeks' time at, for this thing at the time there. Um, I still have no idea how I'm going to get it all into eight minutes in two weeks' time. Yes? Um, sorry to interrupt you so early. I just wanted to know if your name is really Scott Morris. It, it, it really is Scott Morris, and I, I am your future prime minister. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> I, I get this coming through immigration all the time. Yeah. Now. Okay. Um, yeah. So, what are we talking about today? Um, I'm going to tell you a, a bigger story that I'm just a very tiny part of, which is this idea of, of topological quantum computation. And uh, eventually, in the very end of the talk, I'll manage to say a little bit about my work and how it fits into this bigger story. And that's uh, this connection uh, between tensor categories and topological quantum computation. But most of the talk is going to be about this, uh, this bigger and very exciting story of topological quantum computation. Okay, so if you forget absolutely everything I say today and learn nothing at all, try and remember just this one sentence here. Uh, the Jones polynomial is as hard as quantum computation and can be calculated using topological geometry. And the whole talk is just going to be explaining what the words in, those, in that sentence mean and why it's true. Okay, so we're going to start by uh, I'll tell you what the Jones polynomial is. I'll tell you a little bit about what it means to calculate the Jones polynomial. Uh, I'll then spend quite a lot of time talking about quantum computing uh, and explain this idea that, well, these two things are equally hard. If you're good at computing the Jones polynomial, you've basically already got a quantum computer. Conversely, if you had a quantum computer, you'd know how to compute the Jones polynomial. You know, and I'll, I'll have to make that the, the sense I mean that precisely. And then at the end, uh, this is sort of the mathematical part of the talk in some sense, this equivalence here. And then there's some exciting physics and engineering that comes into play as well. Well, you can do both of these things if you can build real physical devices that are, that are described by topological field theories. And it's uh, in this part of, of our topological field theories that many research finally come to. Okay, so let's begin and say what the Jones polynomial is. So the Jones polynomial, uh, well, it's an invariant of links, so do give me uh, a knot, hopefully you can see one, a little one up there. Uh, so just uh, uh, a knotted piece of string, an S line embedded in, in R3. The Jones polynomial spits out a, a, a polynomial that's an invariant, that no matter how you move the knot around in space, as long as you don't cut it and you place it back together, you'll always get exactly the same polynomial. Now, th there's some very slight complication. It's a little one polynomial, not just a polynomial, so we're allowed negative exponents and yes, we get there. And uh, the Jones polynomial, in some sense, is a, is a very elementary thing. Uh, I think the, the definition is basically right here. Uh, to, to, to say what the Jones polynomial of a given link is, you should use the following rules. So what we're going to do is start with the link that we're interested in and start replacing it with formal linear combinations of simple links. So here you're meant to imagine inside some big knot, you're just looking at one particular crossing, but there's everything else outside as well. We can replace that with a formal linear combination of simpler links, where outside everything is the same as it was before, but inside this little circle, this crossing has been replaced either by these two arcs or these two arcs. And I have some coefficients here, a and 1 over a, and a is, is just a sort of change of variables from the cube that we had before. 
And then finally, there's one more rule that any time you see an unknotted circle, this little uh, circle uh, uh, embedded as the, the boundary of a, of a disk, then you can just replace it, you can just remove that, maybe if there's other parts of the knot still leave those alone, and multiply by this factor of minus a squared minus a and minus two. And that's the entire definition. Now, of course, there's stuff to prove. Uh, we'll get to that in just a moment, but first of all, let's do a calculation. Let's just calculate the Jones polynomial of a very small thing. So we're all on the same page. Uh, up on the top right corner there, I've got uh, the rules for calculating the Jones polynomial that we had before. Let's just prove a little lemon to begin with. So here on the left-hand side, I've just got a little king made of a piece of string. Okay? And applying that rule for resolving the crossing, I see that that's A times this diagram, that's A inverse times this diagram. And then in this first term, I can replace this little circle with minus A squared minus A then equal to 2, collect some terms, and I just see that a string with a kink in it is minus a cubed times, uh, times a, a straight piece of string. Similarly, if the kink goes the other way, you get the same answer with a bit negative. And so then we can do our calculation uh, for the hop link, these two circles connected in the easiest possible way. We'll start by looking at this upper crossing in the hop link and resolve that using the rule to get this formal linear combination. And then on each of these guys, we'll see that we can just apply our lemma to remove one of these little twists and each of these diagrams just becomes an unknotted circle. Then we replace the unknotted circles and expand everything out, and finally change the variables back to the peculiar radius of the joint. Okay? Easy. Okay? Everyone knows how to compute the Jones polynomial now, and we can all go home because we've got a quantum computer. <laughs> Not so fast. Um, I'll, I'm going to have to explain in more detail what I mean by computing the Jones polynomial. Uh, but this is, this is what you may do. Okay. So, I gave you a definition, which was just a recipe telling you what to do to produce the polynomial, but I've claimed that it's an invariant of links. First of all, that it didn't depend on how you drew the link, and secondly, that it didn't depend in what order you applied those relations uh, to simplify your liquid diagram. And so there's a theorem here that, really, that it really is an invariant, and being an invariant of links just means that, uh, well, you're going to get the same answer anytime you have two isotopic links, one link that can be deformed into the other. And the, the neat little theorem is that if two links are isotopic, then they differ by a sequence of right and master moves. So here's the first right and master move, taking this little diagram, just a pair of cancelling crossings, and cancelling them to get that. Or the other more interesting right and master move is this guy, where you can think about this many ways, but I like to imagine maybe that vertical string at the back sliding behind the other two strands, sliding in that way. So all that we need to do is check that if we have Links that differ by one of these Rademaster groups, we get the same answer. We get a group of invariants. So Rademaster 2, well, it's just a calculation. You just use this, uh, this formula for expanding out a crossing, see what you get, verify that everything cancels, and you get down to exactly what you would have got that if you started with the static on the static crossing group. And an exercise, a little bit harder, but not too much harder, is to check that you get the same answer on either side of a Rademaster group. So that then proves that the rest of the idea you really is well defined. And it, uh, it gives you an invariant of the link, uh, not just the, the diagram of the link. Okay. So the, the Jones polynomial discovered by Jones uh, in 1984 was a, was a really big deal. It started off uh, revolutioni revolutioni revolutionizing knot theory. Uh, a whole bunch of, of interesting and old conjectures suddenly fell the, once we had the Jones polynomial. Uh, but but more importantly than sort of that internal effect inside knot theory, uh, it really germinated a whole lot of interesting new ideas in three manifold topology and quantum field theory and some other places as well. People sometimes use it thinking about knotted DNA, and uh, people also think about it in the context that I'm going to be talking about today in condensed matter physics and computer science. Okay, so uh, how hard is the Jones polynomial? Well, my claim is that it's exactly as hard as quantum computation, so I'm going to tell you what quantum computation is. Anyway. Okay, so this, this, is, this is now a bit of a complicated definition. Um, so complain if uh, you don't understand what I'm saying, and feel free to ask questions. This is sort of a, uh, this is the, the easiest presentation I could think of, which is this describing what quantum computation is. Okay, so, we're going to be talking about decision problems. So 
that's, that's the sort of problem where uh, you provide some input, maybe encoded it just as a string of bits, and the algorithm is just meant to respond with yes or no. Is, is that input valid or is it invalid? Something like that, okay? And we, we can say that a, a decision problem is in BQPD. This is just some computer science acronym for the class of problems that count as quantum computing. Well, a decision problem is in BQPD if there exists a uniform family of quantum circuits, QN. I'm going to tell you what uniform means, and I'm going to tell you what quantum circuits mean. But for now, let's just jump on and see what these quantum circuits are meant to do. So QN is a gadget that takes n bits as input and outputs a single bit, uh, um, yes or no. But it, but it, does, it produces this output probabilistically in a sort of quantum mechanical sense. Uh, QN will will do some quantum mechanical process to the representation of these n bits. We'll get some quantum state at the end, and we'll do some measurement on it, which will either return yes or no. And now, before we move on, uh, we've got a family of quantum circuits here because each individual circuit is only responsible for dealing with inputs of length n, but we want to be able to deal with arbitrary length inputs. Okay? So we need to have a QN for each different size of input that we want to pass into this process. But there's no overlapping inputs, so you really chop it up. Yeah, I mean, uh, see, I mean, you, 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 you imagine doing something like, say you want to um, uh, factor an integer. Factoring integers is, is in BQP, although I won't say much about that. Uh, I just want you to, as input, uh, write the integer in binary, check how many bits you had to use to write it in binary, and then that select QN for that number of bits as the circuit you're going to use to process it. Um, so what's meant to happen? Well, if the decision problem was meant to say no on that input, we better make sure that the probability that we um, that our measurement says yes is sufficiently low, so less than a third. And if the if, if the decision problem is meant to say yes on that input, we better we, we ask that the probability that it says yes is bigger than some some big enough constant like two thirds. And these one thirds and two thirds are completely irrelevant because you can just run the process a few more times and you can get less than one third to the n or bigger than two thirds to the n. So you measure the probability of the first one. That, that doesn't really matter. Okay. So I haven't said what uniform means, and I haven't said what quantum circuit means, so people understand the, the general framework of, of what we're doing here? Okay. Uh, yeah, uh, just a question. Do we have um, an equivalent for a universal machine, like a Turing machine, where we do it in classic convexity? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is actually pretty much the, you can use almost the same definition for, um, I forget the, uh, the scientists acronyms. Um, so if you just want to have is in P, the, the sort of polynomial time algorithms, then you're just meant to use, well, a family of classical circuits, which will have some slightly different definition than quantum circuits. Well, in those ones uh, are extremely simple. They don't they don't do things probabilistically, they just either say yes or no, and then it's just meant to give the right answer. If you want to look at BPP, the class of probabilistic polynomial time circuits, again you're meant to use a classical circuit, well maybe a classical circuit that's got some random gates in it as well, some gates that can have random effects. And then you just want exactly the same thing, the probabilities of yes and no, or uh, they're sort of in the right direction. Can you have a notion of a uh, quantum Turing machine that would avoid the uh, family of uh, uh, Yeah, yes, yes, yes. There, there, is an, there is a different, uh, yeah, there is a different formalization of quantum computing that looks much more like a, a sort of Turing machine model, but uh, this one is much, much more useful for everything we're going to say today. There is a, yeah, there's a subtle difference, which we won't do. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's say what uniform means first. Uniform, oh, okay, maybe I did the wrong word. Okay, let me tell you what a quantum circuit is first, and then we'll talk, talk about uniform. So what is a quantum circuit? Well, it's like a classical circuit, and it's got some wires coming along, and it's got some gates. But the gates aren't Boolean operations, like AND and OR and XOR. They're, they're little unitary operators. So what should we be thinking here? Uh, you think that the input comes in from the left of this, on this diagram, and each of these strings here, you should think of as carrying a little, say, two-dimensional vector space. Okay? And the whole collection of strings here, you think of as carrying, if there are n strings, we think of this as carrying the two to the, two to the n dimensional vector space, which is just the tensor product of all the vector spaces on the individual strings coming in. 
and then the block in our quantum circuit, say V or W here, is labeled by just a unitary matrix of the appropriate size. So V here has five strings coming in and five coming out. So it's a 32 by 32 unitary matrix. Okay. So that's a that's a quantum circuit. Now, what do we what do we do with a quantum circuit? Well, if you give me a string of bits, I can prepare the appropriate basis vector in this two to the n dimensional space. And this two to the n dimensional space has an actual basis given by the defining strings. And so all that I do is I apply my whole quantum circuit to that input. So here, each gate is just acting on whichever tensor factors it, it covers, it, it, it's lined up. And then at the end of the day, you just uh, take whatever vector you've got in this big vector space and apply it to x, and you take an inner product of just some fixed basis vector. So it's for now. And the probability that we were talking about in the definition before is just a norm squared of that. Okay, so that's a quantum circuit. Uh, sorry. Uh, we've got to finally say what a, what a uniform family is. We're allowed to use a different circuit for each n, and we're just going to make sure that we're not cheating and hiding all the difficulty in making uh, exceedingly complicated circuits for larger and larger n. So the uniform bit here just says that there has to be a classically polynomial time algorithm for writing down all the circuits. Okay? So you're not allowed to cheat and, and use fancy versions of computing to even prepare the circuits you're going to use. You just have to have a bog standard simple way of describing all those circuits. Okay. Okay. Crash bang, course and quantum computing all in one go. Um, that's the formal definition of quantum computation. Uh, so, what can quantum computers do? Which decision problems are in this class BQP? Well, there aren't that many problems that are in BQP, and this is a uh, this is well either sad or mysterious or interesting depending on your point of view. Uh, certainly, all of the things that are in classical polynomial time or classical probabilistic polynomial time, you can still do, uh, but they're not exponentially parallel. No matter what you read in the newspapers and, and magazine articles and popular science books. Uh, I think the, the only way to say why quantum computers work honestly is to tell people one of the handful, very, very short list of actual algorithms that work on a quantum computer. This is, a, this is sad, but it's just a lie to tell people that they try all possible inputs in parallel universes. Okay, so what can they do? Here are four algorithms that they can do, and there are, there are a handful of others, or maybe they're just like generalizations. They can do unstructured search and square it n times. So this is saying that they can find needles in the haystacks of bars. Okay? Usually to find a needle in a haystack, it takes time proportional to the number of bits of pay in the haystack. Quantum computers can do it in time proportional to the square root of the number of squares in that haystack. That sounds exciting, but it's not actually useful because in practice no one bothers looking for those needles. Um, the famous example that, that sort of really uh, grabbed everyone's attention is that integer factorization is polynomial time. Integer factorization is in BQP. Another thing they can do is efficient uh, simulation of other quantum systems. Uh, so, for example, uh, something that uh, is, is sadly very difficult uh, these days is things like building high temperature superconductors, room temperature superconductors. We'd love to, but it's sort of the, the science there is in some sense at the level of cooking. You, you try something and then you go and measure it to see if it's superconducting and you hope it works, and if it doesn't, you fiddle with the ingredients list and try again. Because we just can't simulate these systems. But quantum computers would give us access to a, to a, a huge new set of simulation tools for very different quantum systems. So, uh, oh, okay, maybe I should have said this first while I was complaining about things that not being exponentially parallel. Scott Aronson at MIT writes a wonderful blog and occasionally talks about quantum computing. He said that he studies what computers we don't have yet can't do, and I think uh, he, he gives a very good description of, of what you should and shouldn't expect from quantum computers. Okay, but back to the system of algorithms. Uh, I, I mean, this is yeah. sort of yeah, uh, response to a question sure. Phil had. Now, with the, uh, the unstructured search, we know this is definitely better than the classical. Of course, when it comes to integer factorization, yeah, it is quite possible yeah. that. For, for all three of these, it's quite possible that they just. They're just, they're just classically polynomial as well, and, and it'll be... Uh, we, don't we, don't we don't have a polynomial We don't yet know if that's... We don't have a polynomial No, we don't have a polynomial algorithm for any of these three. And it's, I think, pretty generally expected that it will, 
the these two that are not complete. Uh, I mean, certainly, if this if there's a polynomial, I mean, these two are complete for, for quantum computing in the sense that if there are classical polynomial algorithms for either of these last two, then quantum computing is boring. Uh, not worth trying. But, but, um, but for normal. any of these algorithms, is, is, is it true that the quantum computer is always going to do it at least as good as the classical one, or are there processes which can do better on the classical computer? Oh, well, I mean, it's a practical matter. I mean, our quantum computers are going to, if we ever get them, are going to be extremely small, have a very limited number of qubits, very small open spaces. And so, uh, in practice, if you don't have a particular reason for using an intrinsically quantum algorithm, it's never used a quantum. I mean, you can imagine, I mean, in all these polynomial time questions, there's a constant down the front, or a degree of the polynomial that matters. And sure, it can do things that classical computers can do in polynomial time, still in polynomial time, but you sort of ought to be thinking that the constants are terrible. So they're not going to replace your desktop. Okay, so this, the point is that if you should simulate a quantum computing, a quantum system is a big deal, and that's why we should be trying to build quantum computing. This would, this would be the thing that, that, that changes, that maybe not everything, but it changes a lot. And of course, evaluating the Jones quantum is extremely important. Okay, so now I want to back up this claim that quantum computers can calculate the Jones quantum. Okay. So let's start explaining. Uh, why then this equivalence between uh, quantum computing and evaluating the James Bond number? So, is there a clock in this room? Or is yeah, 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 there there is. There's a red digital clock. Oh, a red digital clock. clock. Yes. Okay, thanks. And you're ahead of schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Just wait. Uh, okay. So, okay, but I'll also take that as a request to slow down a little. Uh, the, so the way we're going to, 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 to prove this equivalence is I'm going to, going to um, describe two, two algorithms. First of all, I'm going to describe a quantum algorithm for the Jones polynomial. So I'm going to draw a uniform family of quantum circuits in, in the sense that we just gave in this definition. Hopefully this will be helpful for working out what all that definition said. And then at a slightly sketchier level, I'll explain how to encode an arbitrary quantum algorithm. You give me that uniform quantum family of quantum circuits. I'll tell you some Jones polynomial calculations you, you ought to go away and do that will tell you the answer to what those Jones, what all those quantum circuits are. So let's start here. Let's start by, by showing that we really can evaluate the Jones polynomial if we have access to the quantum Okay. So here's the, the theorem. So first of all, uh, let's see. I want to take a, a braid B. I haven't said what a braid is. Hopefully, it's going to give us a slide. Yep, it's the next slide. Okay, let me just briefly remind everyone what a braid is if you haven't seen these. So braids are just um, just embeddings of pieces of a string, a little slice of R3, so that one end of the string is all attached to the top of the slab and the other ends are all attached to the bottom. The rule is that, so we say braids are different if they can't be isotoped into each other. So these two are intrinsically different. Oh, uh, these braids are intrinsically different braids. You can't deform one into the other if you don't let yourself move beyond the the ends of the string. Uh, on the other hand, these guys here are the same braid. You can deform those one into the other without moving outside of your little box. This guy here isn't even a braid because of an extra condition I haven't said yet, which is that all of the braid, all of the strings have to continue moving left to right as they're connected. So the tangent vector, the horizontal component of the tangent vector has to, has to, have a, has to be positive. Okay, and finally, if I have some braid, just to confuse you, I've written this braid from bottom to top instead of side to side here, you can do something called the Platt closure, at least if it has an even number of strings in the thread. It just means put these little uh, cups on the bottom and these little caps on the top. And so every any braid here will give you a knot or a link uh, by taking the Platt closure. And an easy theorem, in fact, is that every link can be represented as a Platt closure. So, so for our purposes, uh, braids and links are not so, are so dark. Okay. So what does the theorem say? We take a braid, B, like we just said, and let's suppose it's got n strands and m crossings in the, the diagonal of the braid. Further, let's pick some root of unity, uh, e to the pi i over k, and some, and some tolerance, some small epsilon. Then, there is a quantum algorithm uh, who, where, which is, um, where the I've written polynomial in n, m, k, and one over epsilon, but it basically you can just 
interpret that as you can encode n and k in one over epsilon as, a, in, as an input string uh, in a polynomial way. Uh, and this, this quantum algorithm tells you the value of the Jones polynomial of the flat closure of the braid evaluated at q being this root of unity uh, within epsilon. So basically, you feed into this quantum algorithm as input um, what the braid is, um, what q is, uh, and what epsilon is, and you'll answer yes or no, is the Jones polynomial of that flat closure evaluated at this point within epsilon of the, I guess you also have to pass in the value you're asking, but you know, it'll, it'll tell you yes or no is the value of the Jones polynomial in the SE space flat. Many parts of the brain. The, uh, um, yeah, you could actually read it out of the proof of language and do it here, but I don't. I've never thought about what that is. But we're, we're, we're going to explicitly give the quantum circuit the SE. Okay. Uh, okay, so here's the idea uh, for computing the, the Jones polynomial. You're just going to have to take on faith a few facts about the Jones polynomial. So first of all, let's think about this Hilbert space, uh, H sub n, which is going to be, I said paths, but I think I need to say loops. Yeah, let's say loops instead. Loops of length n on this graph, a k minus one. So a k minus one uh, is just, uh, oh God, sorry, I wrote water wrong. Before we, okay, before I, sorry, let me back, go back a moment. Before I get trying to get let me tell you the history of this theorem. It's certainly not mine. Uh, the, the presentation I'm giving is in this very wonderful paper, uh, a polynomial quantum algorithm for approximating the Jones polynomial. Uh, but the essential idea, although stated very differently, uh, goes back to this paper with Friedman, Katai, and Long a few years ago. These are the guys who, who really had the breakthrough idea that it was possible to do this, and, uh, but gave a, a very complicated explanation of what was going on. This paper is the top paper the top. So let's, sorry, now let's jump back into the, the proof. Uh, so we've got this HN, it's formal linear combinations of uh, loops of length N on this graph. So this AK minus one here is just this Dinkin diagram. It's a string of, of vertices connected by simple edges. And so uh, we're gonna think about loops that are, that are based at this, at this star base point here. So a loop of length four, for example, might go right, right, left, left, and left, backwards. Okay. So we have this, we have this vector space, which is just the formal linear combinations of the loops along that path. Let me um, show you what those loops look like. So you can think about them for a moment. Here are the 14 basis vectors of that, that vector space we're working in. I've just drawn them. Uh, so this is the path that goes right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left. Okay. So you can see what, how each of those corresponds to some loop. And the combinatorialists amongst you will already know the proof that these are counted by Cowan numbers. And that's what this 14. Okay, so we've got this, this little vector space I defined, and it turns out that there's a very nice uh, representation of, first of all, the temporal Lieb algebra, if you know what that is, but importantly for us today, because of the action of the temporal Lieb algebra, there's just an action of the braid group on this vector space. So for each n, the action of the n strand braid group on this vector space h n, and this is sort of the, in some sense, determines the, the Jones polynomial. And it determines it in this sense, well, you can write down some fixed vector, let's just call it z, in this space of formal linear combinations. And it turns out that the Jones polynomial of the flat closure of some braid is exactly what you get by starting with this vector z, applying your braid from the braid group to that vector z in this representation, and then computing the inner product with, uh, with that z again. Okay? The inner product here is just the one that makes this basis of it. Okay, so. <coughs> This is sort of, you need to know some representation theory to know that this representation exists and that it computes the Jones polynomial. We're just going to take that as a black box for now. Okay. okay. So, what we're going to do is take this vector space Hn and embed it in a bigger vector space, which is just a, a tensor product vector space, where each of these paths can be encoded as a sequence of up, down, up, down, up. But there are some conditions. You've got to come back to where you started, and you're never allowed to go too far to the right. And you're not allowed to go back to the left of where you started. So it's certainly not the whole vector space, okay? But we can think of it in some particular subspace of this big vector space whose basis is sequences of ups and downs. 
So now what we're going to do is think about how the brain group is acting on this subspace of this nice easy tensor product space. And the, the nice thing that could happen is that the braid group was acting locally. That is, when you braid, say, the second and third strands over each other, it would only be acting on the second and third tensor products in this big tensor product, and acting by the identity on all the other tensor factors we've drawn up. Well, that would be nice and easy, and if that were true, the Jones polynomial wouldn't be as hard as quantum computing. Uh, it turns out something that a little bit more complicated is going on. The braid group, the way the braid group acts, well, it only affects the, when it's acting, say, when you're crossing the second and third strands, it only affects things in the, um, in the second and third spots, but the way in which it affects them depends on some of the other sets of factors. Okay, so it's a bit more complicated. And in particular, it, the way it affects those those sets of factors just depends on the height of the path at that point. So where the, the total number of times you've gone up and down by the time you get to, to that. Okay, so here's an algorithm now that, uh, given given this fact. Here's a, here's a quantum circuit that computes the Jones form. When we want to act by some, when we want to act by some uh, brain in the brain group, just a single crossing of two streams on one of these, these paths, well, we, we encode our path by a sequence of up and down to this big tensor product vector space here. But we add an extra, uh, an extra auxiliary register, an extra little help space sitting here. It's going to have sign log k, where k was the order of the written unit here. The sign of the graph we're working on. And basically, all that we do is, to begin with, we just uh, record in this register what height the path was at by the time we got, got up to the point we wanted to apply the brick. So we just make these strings interact, and if this string wasn't up, then we increment this, and if you think of this auxiliary, we're just holding a binding number. So that's what k is here. So we interact with this, this first string, and we just decide how we've gone up or down. Called the height so far here. Then we drag to the next screen and we just look if we went up or down and update the height that we're keeping track of here, and so on. And then finally, we can apply some unitary operator here, and uh, we can arrange it so that it modifies these two strings in exactly the way that the brain group is meant to be acting on these two strings using this extra information of what height the path is currently at. Okay, we've almost all be done, except that we need to make sure that every time we do this, this auxiliary register starts at height zero, because we're doing the counting up as we go along here. But in quantum computing, you're not allowed to do anything irreversible. So you're not allowed to just throw out those, those auxiliary registers and set them back to zero. Fortunately, though, what you can do is you can sort of unmeasure the height you were at and do the same computation in reverse, by interacting with all these lower strings one by one and subtracting now instead of adding a, a, a one or a minus one and then going up. And so by the time you finish doing all of this, this auxiliary register is clean again, no longer, uh, it, it just says zero again, and you're ready to apply the, oh. the next crossing. Right. I'm assuming the basic issue that comp complicates this is that when you apply these basic operations, they don't commute. Uh, I mean, yes, so it's, yeah, so it's very good, it's not, not, not commutative, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, yeah and obviously there's some calculations that that go into this to tell you that you really can undo exactly what you did before and so on. Yeah. Okay. And okay, so that's the quantum algorithm. You wrote your braid, which is just a whole sequence of performing crossings on the case of strands. Each of those times you want to cross two strands, you use the following recipe to realize that that braiding operation by, by by a unitary operator that is written as a as a quantum circuit with respect to this tensor product here. And so we've got a, a quantum circuit for computing the Jones form. Okay. Let's briefly talk about the other direction now. So, well, okay, so maybe just before we go on, um, <clears throat> this tells you that if, so the summary now is that if you have access to a quantum computer, if you can implement quantum algorithms, then you can do this evaluation. So what about the other direction? So for the other direction, uh, we need to take an arbitrary uh, quantum algorithm, a, a BQP decision problem, L, and we need to be able to, um, 
you need to be able to, by only doing your own polynomial calculations, provide the answers that running that quantum algorithm would have provided. Re reproduce the probabilities that, the, that we would see with running those, those, those quantum mechanisms. Okay, so let's set up a little bit more. Uh, so let's fix the root of unity again, Q, uh, e to the pi i over k. But now, bizarrely, there are some restrictions. K can be five, or K can be seven or more, but it can't be six, and it can't be four, and it can't be three. Things just don't work if you, if you try these small roots in there. Okay, so the claim now is that, say we've got some input x that we were considering putting into our decision problem and seeing and, and measuring the probabilities that, that, that occur. Instead, what we can do, well, in classical polynomial time, we can write down some ray instead that depends on the, on the input x, so we'll call that ray b sub x, uh, in such a way that the Jones polynomial of the plant closure of that ray, well, suitably normalized by some numerical factor, just depending on n, that's what that delta n is for. Well, uh, the, this, this number is going to be small, exactly as the decision problem is term true, and this number is going to be big, that is, sort of between two thirds and one, if the decision problem is going to be false. So we can recover all the answers that the decision problem is going to give us through applying this classical construction of the ray of the x from input x and evaluating the Jones polynomial of, of the plant closure of that ray. Okay? So this is the this is the converse. Any quantum algorithm can be, can be uh, simulated just by doing Jones polynomial evaluation. And again, uh, this theorem in some form or another goes back to that same Friedman Larson Long paper. Oh sorry, no, it goes to a different Friedman Long paper that has Larson instead of Kataev in it. Uh, but again, it's a bit hard to uh, extract from the paper exactly what they're doing, and there's a beautiful presentation in, in uh, Aronoff about what that pretty much the state is. Okay. So, uh, well, hmm. I guess I will briefly say the sketch of this theorem. I feel like the, my sketch of the previous theorem is already sufficiently sketchy that uh, everyone was unhappy, and you're only going to be unhappier with this sketch. But let's, uh, let's very quickly go through it anyway, and then we'll get back to talking about other things. Okay, okay so uh, we had a BQP algorithm for L. So in particular, um, it tells us this quantum, this quantum circuit, QN, that we're meant to be using for quantum system size things. And it turns out to be an easy reduction. You can just assume that it only uses two qubit gates. That is, you can assume that all those unitary boxes in the quantum circuit only have two springs coming in and two springs coming. That's just an easy theorem that you can approximate unitaries on big spaces by compositions of, of uh, tensor products of unitaries on, on small things. So that's a, an easy reduction. Okay. And so again, let's think about this vector space HL. Uh, again, I'm wrong, I should have said loops of length L on this graph, A k minus one. Here k is the root of unity that we're working at. And again, remember that this vector space comes with an action to the L small grid. Before, what we did was we took this vector space of linear combinations of loops and embedded it in a bigger tensor product space. Now we're going to do something else. We're going to embed a tensor product vector space into this vector space. Okay? So I'm going to take uh, C, uh, C to the 2n, and I'm going to stick it in uh, the space of linear combinations of loops of length 4n via this embedding. Uh, so, um, so here, I mean, you can think of a basis for this space here is just binary strings of length here. Okay? And so all that you do is you read the binary string. Anytime you see a zero, you go up, down, up, down. Anytime you see a one, you go up, up, down, down. Okay? So every binary string then gives us some vector in this, uh, in this space H4. And now the, the, the fabulous lemma is that um, in this encoding, say you've got some quantum circuit acting on this C to the 2n that just fills out of, out of um, uh, uh, gates that act on two strings at once. Okay. Well, each gate that acts on two strings at once is, in, well, each, each two strings, uh, Pair of two strings here corresponds to 
eight steps of this path here. Okay, this uh, this C to the two n is going to H four, and each bit here was being embedded into into was was being sent to a path in H four here. And it turns out that any two qubit gate to any unitary operator, any four by four unitary operator, under this embedding can be approximated very well by some eight strand gradient. Okay, and it can be polynomial polynomially approximated, meaning that if you want the approximation to be uh, to within sort of one in epsilon, within norm epsilon, you have to use a gradient of like you know, one over epsilon, some polynomial. Okay. And again, um, this is something you have to go away and think about this particular representation on the space uh, and show how to, to approximate all the different unitaries using the Okay, but the point then is that the entire circuit, which is now built out of many two strand gates, can be approximated by some big four n strand gate. Each, each little box is just being replaced by some eight strand red, and now we've got lots of eight strand reds next to each other uh, across all of these things. Okay, and the, by the way, that we've, we've set things up, you just, um, you, we well, have to do some setup input and output that, that I won't go into here, but the point now is just that. The, if you took the input x and applied the quantum circuit to it, and uh, and then measured the inner product with this, this fixed space inspector of zeros, you can arrange things so that that is very very close to the, uh, the evaluation of the Jones Okay, that was a bit rushed and a bit unsatisfactory, but the idea is you approximate all the unitaries by sufficiently complicated gradients, and the gate groups are, are dense enough in these unitary groups. Okay, so there we go. We've now proved more or less that calculating the Jones polynomial, now we can say more precisely, we're approximating it additively in some window, at a, at a window of unity, is just as hard a problem as arbitrary quantum computation according to this uh, uh, quantum circuit's definition. Okay, that's all very nice, and uh, there are if you if I had actually given the details properly, they would constitute two very nice mathematical theorems. What on earth is the point? Why on earth should we care that the Jones polynomial is as hard as quantum computation? Well, of course, the point is that this gives us a new way to build a quantum computer, a potential new way to build a quantum computer. Um, I'll, I'll comment in a moment on the likelihood of this being a reasonable way to build a quantum computer, but we'll get there. Okay, so I want to explain that. Uh, evaluating the Jones polynomial uh, at roots of unity is something that can be done if you have access to a physical system described by Tucker and Toolberg. So the claim is that there really are physical systems which, which, which evaluate Jones polynomials for you, and these are the topological field theories. I'm not going to say in general what they are, but let me tell you what a topological field theory in 2 plus 1 dimension. So, to each surface sigma, sphere, a torus, a higher genus surface, it associates some Hilbert space, which I'll write as, as, as C of sigma. And to each cobordism, so this is some three manifold boundary, where the, the boundary is split up into an incoming piece of the boundary and an outgoing piece of the boundary. The incoming and outgoing boundaries are both two manifolds again. So we can think of this cobordism as sort of being a type of map from the surface of its incoming boundary to the surface of its outgoing boundary, well, the topological field theory associates to each such cobordism a unitary operator from the Hilbert space associated the incoming surface to the Hilbert space associated the outgoing surface. Okay, so how do we get from that something to do with the Jones polynomial? Well, we're going to look at the case where uh, the surface we've got is a punctured disk. So look at the bottom of this picture here, there's a disk, and it's got five punctures drilled out. And that's the sort of thing that we're, that, that a topological field theory is going to associate a Hilbert space to. Now the grade groups are just the mapping class groups of punctured disks, which basically means that the ways that you can take a punctured disk and move the holes around uh, around each other is exactly the grade. And you can see here, um, you can think of this grade as sort of tracing out a history of the, of the motions of the, of the punctures. And so in particular, a TQFT of this sort gives straight away a unitary representation of the grade group. Okay? It gives some vector space associated with the n-punctured disk, and for every grade it gives us a unitary operator in that vector space. 
this is here. Now, the lovely theorem, it goes right back to the beginning, so double and go theories. Uh, if you would have k, there is a double and go theory. In fact, it's, it's one of the really pressure to derive field theories. Such that uh, the, the Jones polynomial with the flat closure of that grade. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, it is that, okay. The Jones polynomial with the flat closure of that grade, so this is just some number that we've evaluated the Jones polynomial with the is given by some inner product in this representation. You take some fixed scaling vector, you apply the unitary operator corresponding to this representation, the thread of the implementation of the product with, uh, with that synthetic name. And again, it's synthetic. And uh, the point is that these particular couple of field theories, uh, it exactly calculates this evaluation as a, as a sort of quantum mechanical average in the product, which would take the operator out and Okay, so that's lovely. Um, but topological field theories, of course, are just, uh, I guess, made up gadgets for mathematicians who can't cope with, uh, with real quantum field theory, um, except that they're not. Turns out that topological field theories exist in the real world. Um, so the, 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 the idea is that there are actual lab bench top systems whose behavior is, is to some to some degree of idealization described by topological field theories. So the, the, the primary and most famous example of this is, a, is this thing called the fractional quantum field theory. So in the in the fractional quantum hall, and let me just briefly say this, uh, so the, the Hall effect is just if you take a, a wire with a current running down it, and you put a big magnetic field across it. The, you've got charges moving in a magnetic field, so they experience a force to the side, and you'll be able to measure a little voltage across the thickness of the wire, because the charge carriers are being moved to one side of the wire. So that's the quantum Hall effect. The, so that's the Hall effect, the classical Hall effect. The quantum Hall effect is that at very low temperatures and very high magnetic fields, you see this relationship between the potential across the wire and your other parameters, say the magnetic field, stops being a linear relation and turns into this little sort of, uh, linear step function that goes up in, in integer steps. And then right down at the bottom of this little graph of the, the potential versus the magnetic field, you see little, little steps of fractional effects. And so uh, some of the, the fractional quantum Hall effect says, um, seem to be really interesting and appear in some sense to be described by double field theory. So the, the interesting state that people talk about is this five half state and this tall fifth state. And uh, the, the five half state corresponds it's pretty well understood in the double field theory description is a good one. It corresponds to that k equals four root of unity, uh, k equals four evaluation of the Jones polynomial. But if you remember, that's no good. K equals four is one of our exceptions to our theorems. Uh, and this full fifth state, everything in the physics is a lot messier, the engineering is harder and so on. And there's some sign that, that, it, that, it really, that it's described by the K equals five case. But things get complicated. Okay, so the picture is basically that you're going to have this little puddle of fractional quantum Hall effect liquid sitting in between your interface between your Gallium arsenide crystals, however they build these things. And maybe there are going to be some defects in the middle where the fractional quantum Hall effect isn't taking place. And the idea now is just the quantum mechanical ground state, the Hilbert space that quantum mechanics prescribes for the system, will be that same Hilbert space that the topological field theory prescribes for that, that function surface. And now what you'd like to do is, well, stick your fingers in these holes, or maybe stick an atomic force microscope in these holes or something, and move them around. And then, if this is described by a topological field theory, the unitary operator that described the time evolution of the system will be exactly that gradient reduction in the Hilbert space that we got from the And so, the idea now is if you build these devices and manipulate them and they're really described by the topological field theory, you take your quantum algorithm, you approximate it by something gray, you literally gray the defects around each other in your little device, and you perform some measurement at the end. So, uh, Mike Friedman and his group at Station 2 uh, are trying to do literally this, or maybe I should say some more subtle and clever variations of this, uh, which are mathematically more complicated to describe. Um, but this is really the essential idea. Uh, and, uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, maybe I'll just say at this point 
um, that this is this idea is what's usually called topological quantum computation, and you should think of it as sort of an even crazier approach to building quantum computers. Almost certainly, if we get around to building a quantum computer, it won't be via this approach. It will be via the standard approach. That there are people at this university, maybe some of you in this room, in case I'm terrified. Um, uh, the, the, the standard approach is is, uh, is much more plausible. Uh, but this is a different approach, which will succeed or fail, in some sense, for almost independent reasons. Okay? It has a different set of problems, uh, and it, it, it has a different set of problems. Uh, one thing that you should, the thing that you should think about is that these systems somehow have uh, error correction built into the hardware level. Uh, and the very, I mean, uh, a very hand-raising version of this is to say something like, well, imagine that you, you raid these defects around each other, but you're not very good at raiding around each other. Your hands are shaky from moving around each other. Okay? The topological invariance of the system ensures that as long as you implement the right braid, if things go around each other the right number of times, it doesn't matter if you're all the path they still on the way. Okay? But you can see in that sort of idea um, a sort of hardware level error correction. Of course, the actual engineering to do this is incredibly difficult. Okay, so in the last uh, what moment have I meant to stop? Two minutes ago, or do I still have three minutes? Two minutes. Two minutes ago? <laughs> okay, okay. Um, in that case, I'm not going to say anything about this, except that um, the big question for me is what TQFTs are out there. Um, it turns out that TQFTs are, are classified by, by purely algebraic data. The, for example, you know, different, in different situations, by different algebraic data. And the main thing that I study are uh, these higher categorical structures that tell you what TQFTs exist. Uh, we have, we're, we're very extremely ignorant. We don't know what's out there. We don't have good structure theory. We don't know how to decompose these, these algebraic structures into smaller pieces, like we know how to decompose groups into simple groups. Uh, but we're learning more examples. We're, we're proving classification results. And the hope is that we can give some indication based on these mathematical classifications of the examples we can give some, some hints back to the physicists and engineers which TQFTs they should be looking for in physics, which ones will be useful for quantum computing, which ones won't be, and, uh, and hopefully contribute to uh, this approach to building quantum computing. I'll stop there. Thanks. Yeah? I guess the, the crucial thing is really unitary representations of the gray group. So, I, I guess my question is, for example, you can get them via finite group algebra, quantum double finite group algebra, which you get unitary R matrices, and hence gray generators. So, yeah, I don't know if they correspond to the topological quantum field theories or not. So, I guess I've got the question: Is that all you really need to do this as a no, unitary okay. representation? I mean, do no, you really no, need? No. So every time, you, okay. So um, let me very briefly grab a piece of this slide, um, there's this idea of a modular tensor category. This is basically uh, a tensor category so with objects that we know how to, to tensor product them together, vector spaces, but they don't, they're not symmetric. V tensor W uh, isn't just boringly the same as W tensor B. You have to use the gradient in order to move it into the And there are plenty, there were plenty of examples of other graded tensor categories. The big conjecture at the moment is that a modular tensor category is universal for quantum computation exactly if it is not weakly integral. So what, was, what does weakly integral mean? In a modular tensor category, all of the objects in the category have a dimension, which a priori is just a complex number. Uh, if it's a unitary modular tensor category, then it's a positive real number. An integral category is one where all those dimensions are integers. For example, all the Hopf algebra examples, the dimensions of the objects are integers because there are underlying vector spaces. Weakly integral is slightly weaker that um, the dimensions are square roots of integers. And the conjecture at the moment is exactly that everything where the dimensions are square roots of integers is no good. The gray group representations are good answer for integral quantum computing. But anything where you have a category with a dimension that is not the square root of an integer, the gray group action will be good enough to build quantum computing. We're very, very far from proving that conjecture, but that's the, that's the hope. And so all the hop yeah, the hop the, the finite group hop algebra kind of examples don't. Just one last question. It's related, I think, to the quantum closure. Yeah. 
So how how is that related to the other sort of the closure where you the, connect the trace closure? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, so it's a different thing. There are there are um, there are interesting results about approximating. Uh, um, well, if you, you 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 can use trace closures and and. I forget what the theorem is. There's some, from what I remember, there is actually some intrinsic problem, and you, I don't know of a proof that sort of evaluating the Jones polynomial as good as quantum computation uses a, uses trace closures rather than flat closures. But I have no understanding whatsoever of that. That would be interesting. One of the reasons for that. I think I know the papers that explain this, but I don't. Like I could point, I could know, I know where to go look. Yeah. Okay, uh, I guess you talked about uh, two bits and you have up, have up and down. Two of these, yeah. yeah. What if you use three bits instead of Catalan numbers and you then get one string number? Um, yeah, sure. Um, um, the, uh, I'm not really sure what to say. Um, the, the bridge of actions that we're getting here are really the bridge group actions associated to the quantum group SU2, and um, there's just really, uh, these, are the, these are the right representations that you're meant to use if you want to start with, with SU2. You can do more complicated things. You get bridge group actions from any quantum group, any UQG, the G of complex simple D algebra. You could use SL, SU3 instead of SU2, and then you'd have walks on this triangular lattice, like the, the, the vial chamber for SL3. And you could prove all these theorems again in that other context and you could do other sorts of walks. But, but I actually meant to, to stick with this or two, or oh. two but instead of using tensor products to spin up, you would use tensor products oh, to spin up. Oh, spin oh, oh, I see. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, I think everything should just work. Using, using, uh, yeah, I mean, you get a very good representation on V tensor power M for any, any representation V of, of SL2. Sure. I mean, there I think it would be better to think about paths that either went right or went left or stayed still for them. But, a, but it wouldn't be the Jones polynomial. It wouldn't be the Jones polynomial anymore. Do they color Jones polynomial and get about everything? But the idea of all the theorems is correct. I think we should probably wrap it up. I think there's more questions, but we'll be having tea in the tea room, so please uh, join us there for more questions. Thank you.